Hi, this is Jeff Gottlieb, and uh, we're going to do another show on Earth Skills. And this is the most earthy of all skills that I'm going to demonstrate and explain today. This is mankind's oldest craft. And we'll talk about not only what it is and why people did it and what it was good for, but maybe what lessons it has for us today. I'm talking about flint napping. I'm talking about the ability to take chosen rocks and minerals and break them with controlled fracture to create stone tools, cutting tools, drilling tools, uh, bone carving tools, uh, wood chopping tools, flesh cutting tools. So I'll start by telling a story. I kind of adapted this story from uh, Steve Watts, who was the dir director of Aboriginal Studies at the Shield Museum in Gastonia, and he told the, his version of this story many, many years ago, and I, I loved it so much, I kind of filled in all the gaps in my memory and built a, built a story out of it. So, let's say, you, you could start a story with Once Upon a Time, and you know how when people say that, they don't tell you what time? Well, I'm going to tell you not only the story, but when. So, Once Upon a Time, 2.6 million years ago, all of our great 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 I don't know how many greats grandma we could call her mega grandma was walking across the savannah in East Africa and she was a young mother at the time and she hadn't found anything good to eat in days and her kids were very hungry and she was very hungry and she lucked into something fantastic the lions had killed a really large antelope and had left an entire leg. Now, that leg weighed about as much as she did, which was about 80 pounds. She stood about four feet tall. Um, and this was a tremendous stroke of luck. Look at all that food. So she I couldn't really carry it. It weighed as much as she did. So she started just tearing off chunks with her, her fingers and her teeth. She didn't have any tools. so. She had gotten a couple of good mouthfuls in there when she heard growling behind her and turned to a very, very unpleasant surprise. A hyena had smelled the meat. And you know what you do when you weigh 80 pounds and a 160 pound hyena wants what you have? You give it to him. But she was not giving this up without a fight, without a chance. So she picked up the nearest object and threw it at the hyena and missed. So discretion being the better part of valor, she ran away, went over a couple of hills and then threw herself down and hid and listened to more and more hyenas getting the smell of the meat and coming over, listening to the growling and chomping and slurping and licking and crunching and chewing and all those sounds she wanted to be making. And then after a while the sounds died away. So she went back to the spot to see, did the hyenas leave anything? nothing, not even a blood stain. They had eaten the hair, the skin, the bones, the hoofs, all the meat, sinews, everything. Well, she was pretty disappointed, but you know, easy come, easy go. But something caught her attention. That rock that she had thrown hit another rock when it landed and it cracked open. And it was a different color and texture on the inside. So she was interested. She went over, she looked at it. It was kind of like this, where one part of it was all, you know, scrubby and very colored, and the other part was all shiny and glossy. And she was so interested, she reached out to touch it and yay, cut her finger. She put her finger in her mouth and she's thinking. She thought, well, it cut me. I'm taking this. So she took it. And she brought it back. She came to her children and she didn't have any meat to give them or food to give them but she had a story. So she acted out the story about she found it and the hyenas came and she threw the rock and it broke and she showed them the rock. And they started to get ideas. They started to say, wow, I could probably dig a hole with that thing and proceeded to do it. And another one said, I could probably cut down a stick for you know, using it as a tool, and proceeded to do it. 
And another one got some meat, a little dead bird or something, and was able to cut it up. And so all of her children and her thought this was the greatest tool you could possibly want. And they kept taking it here to use it and taking it there to use it and stealing it out from each other's noses until one day one of her kids lost it. She was so upset. But her kids said, well, how did you get this thing? So she started to tell the story again, and they said, threw a rock against another rock? Then we'll do it. And you, this is not a place you wanted to be an innocent bystander because the rocks were ricocheting and bouncing off each other. But they figured out that if you hit certain kinds of rocks and they break, you get a sharp edge. And this kind of made-up story could be kind of a paraphrase of how human beings first discovered stone tools. And without stone tools, there wouldn't have been any tools. There wouldn't have been any hardware. There wouldn't have been the discovery that if you were to make something out of metal, you could make the same style of tool but make it longer lasting. Because you know how she made that tool out of a rock and it broke? Well, if you make a tool out of a rock and you drop it, it breaks. It's really sharp. Let's see just how sharp. Here's a piece of leather. It's deerskin leather. And uh, it's probably not quite as thick as your shoe, but it wouldn't be easy to poke a hole in it. You need really good scissors to cut it. Watch what a broken piece of flint will do. Let's see. I glued the edge when I tanned this hide. It should work easily. I'm not able to hold the, the leather still, that's the problem. Okay, there we go. Not bad for a little broken piece of rock. So, is this a sophisticated arrowhead or knife blade? No, it's just a broken piece of rock. Okay, how does it break? This is important. The um, what we call fracture mechanics of flint napping. So what we're doing is controlled fracture and what I'm going to show you first is percussion flaking. So the idea is that this stuff has an angle at which it breaks when you hit it. So let's say I took a, a piece of flint, kind of a flattish piece, and I hit it with a rock. What's going to happen is the shock waves of me hitting it don't go straight through. I don't break it right off. The shock waves travel out and away in all directions, and they create a cone, a Hertzian cone, and it has a, a fixed angle no matter what stone you hit, if it will do this at all, it will make a Hertzian cone. It will break at this angle. So you have probably seen a Hertzian cone. If you've ever seen a glass window that's been hit by a pebble or a BB or something, and there's a cone-shaped hole in the glass, that's what happened. It was hit by a hard object, and the shock wave went out and away until it got all the way through and the piece fell out. So, being the scientist and the craftsman that I am, I've spent years and years and years looking for the little cone that fell out. I don't usually find them. They usually break into pieces. But, that's what's going on. Now, you see in my diagram, it changes from a solid line to a dotted line. If that shock wave is going through a thick rock, it will eventually slow down and not go all the way through the rock. So you could start breaking it and then not break it. So you can actually find rocks that show this. I don't imagine you can see in this rock. No, not very well. But anyway, if you find cobbles of flint, you will see these little 
round marks from where they were hit. And this happens, I mean, I picked this rock up in the surf on Long Island a while back. And they, they're, of course, roll with the waves and hit each other. So you'll see this sort of a thing. So these rocks actually have kind of a crust of started cones that never went very deep because they only hit each other a little bit. So, all right, what are we trying to do? We are trying, what, first of all, what, are we, what, what rocks will work? All of these rocks are cryptocrystalline quartzes. That means their main ingredient is silicon dioxide. Guess what? That's the main ingredient in glass. So glass is a perfect practice material if you ever wanted to try this and get good at it and whatever. Practice on glass because, you know what? Natural flint deposits of good quality are not very common and they're getting less common all the time because people are literally digging them up by the ton and selling them to people who are breaking them into little pieces. So, practice on glass. It works. Okay, so, what are we doing? Let's look at some of the rocks that we're doing it to. Um, this is obsidian. This is literally natural glass. Um, it was poured out by a volcano. It's the same ingredient as quartzes and flints, things like that, but this is not cryptocrystalline. It has no crystals because it poured and cooled. It didn't have time to make crystals. So this is really very similar to glass. So you can imagine glass is easy to break. So I won't have to hit this obsidian very hard to break a piece off if I want a piece of this. So let's see, where will I set this up to take a piece off? All right. What, what happens when I break this, if I were to hit it in the middle and that cone goes out in all directions, I'll just break my rock. If I were to set it up so that I matched the angle that I showed you before, is it 60 degrees or something like that? What if, what if I tilted the rock so that we hit the edge and 60 degrees was out in space, out in space, out in space, or just skimmed right under the surface of the rest of this rock. So that's what I'm going to try. And if it skims just under the surface, what happens is the flake falls off. And let's see if we can do it. I'm going to protect my leg by putting a piece of a heavy padded piece of leather on there. And I'm going to try to make the biggest possible flake happen by putting some support and pressure against the underside of the rock. It seems to matter, a few things matter in how long your shockwave will travel. One of them is... Can I help at all? By holding something? No, no, I, I don't want anybody else to get cut. This, is, this, is the, this will create the sharpest object you have ever seen in your life. Truly, um, a broken edge of obsidian can be 500 times sharper than a steel scalpel. So surgeons are doing surgery with edges that are duller than broken rocks. And people have discovered this, and there are companies that are producing glass and obsidian scalpels for use in surgeries. Because there are surgeries where um, scarring would be a really big issue, like in retinal surgery or heart valves or something like that, where the, the, the tissue has to heal up perfectly or else there's big trouble. So you want the sharpest possible scalpel so that you don't have any tearing, you just have the two edges of the cut and then you put them back together and they heal right back up. So that's the that's minimal scarring. So um, obsidian scalpels, surgeons are actually using glass and obsidian scalpels. Not many. They're very resistant to going backwards in time mm -hmm. when the big money is in forwards into technology today. You know, They'd rather use a laser than a broken rock. But the broken rock works fantastic. Okay, so watch this. Now, it's called percussion flaking, so I am going to hit it. And what should I hit it with? 
I want to hit it with something that is hard enough to stay together when I hit it, but soft enough or crumbly enough to have a little bit of give at the moment when it hits the obsidian. Because if this rock is as hard as that rock, they're going to hit and bounce. In which case, I would rather have all the forward motion keep going. So if this thing crumbles when it hits, it will stay moving forward that little bit longer. Okay? So what happened is, shockwave traveled, it followed a ridge, which it wants to, it followed a curve, which it wants to, and it separated. And there is my unbelievably sharp cutting tool. Now, it's a little unwieldy as a cutting tool because it doesn't have a handle, some parts are thin, some parts are thick, but this is the sharpest object you have ever laid eyes on. Because how do you get a sharp scalpel? You have to grind it on a microscopically rough surface. This got sharp because the shock wave traveled through the stone thinner and thinner and thinner until it neared the surface. And remember, there are no crystals. There's no grain structure. So this breaks right down to the last molecule in thickness. So it is the thinnest, cleanest edge you can make. If you saw a microscopic photograph of a broken edge of obsidian, it would be a neat line. If you saw the scalpel, it would be jagged. So that's why this is sharper, because of the way that it breaks. So I have to be careful where I put this. If I put it in my pocket, it will cut its way out of my pocket and cut my leg. I have to wrap it up in something. So luckily, I brought some leather pieces with me. Now, if I wanted to make something useful out of this, I would need to keep breaking little pieces off of it in the pattern that I was after. So what are some other rocks that we might have in our area? Well, first of all, we don't have a lot of good rocks for flaking. The closest thing we have this is quartz, and it's difficult. It's really difficult to use because this is, this is also not crypto crystal, and crypto means hidden. So quartz has crystal structure. It has obvious crystal structure. So it has fracture planes. It has directions that it wants to break when struck. Now, if I'm trying to make something, I don't want to listen to what the rock has to say. I want to tell the rock what I want it to do and have it do it. So that's a big drawback. So you typically are going to end up with thicker, kind of steeper angled pieces and usually not too big. If you find an artifact made of quartz, an old spear point, and it looks halfway decent, and then you pick up a flint one, and the flint one looks absolutely gorgeous, you can't assume that the maker of the flint one was better at it than the maker of the quartz one. The fact that the guy took the quartz at all and made it into a functional blade at all says he's a good flint napper. So, so around here, most of the artifacts we find, they're made out of quartz. And uh, this is a terrible chunk. There's better, but... Quartz can vary. This is... considerably better. This is a cobble. I picked it up off the beach. I could go ahead and keep knocking flakes off of it. I can see the angle that this broke. It conforms to the fracture plane of quartz. So people used quartz when they had nothing else. If they had their druthers, they would use other things. This is from the Flint River in Georgia. And it comes in really big chunks. It breaks cleanly and makes beautiful, beautiful tools. And uh, it's readily accessible. It used to be more accessible in the old days, but uh, yeah. So this stuff is great. So I, I bought a big chunk from somebody that dug it up. And I'm proceeding to break it into little pieces one at a time and then make things out of the little pieces. So I could 
continue turning this big piece and into one big tool. Why? This. Now, this is not that same flint. This actually came from Texas. But it's really good flint. So when you try to break it, it breaks very, it's co very cooperative. You can get it to break the way you planned for it to break if you do it right. So that's kind of the secret to getting big, really nice tools. Get really good material in really big pieces and then do everything right. So some of my pieces come out this nice, not all of them. Now, a piece like this, it's not that useful. This is really a showpiece. This is one of the biggest pieces that I've made. And uh, this was actually uh, in a filming of a television show once. I sent this off and it was put into a, a fake museum exhibit in, in a, uh, a TV show that was being filmed. And so they filmed it and they sent it back to me. So it's oversized so that it would look good on camera. And um, yeah, it came out well. So what would be a useful size? If you find artifacts across the United States, a whole lot of them are that big and smaller. This is one I made. And uh, they go down to little tiny triangles about this big. And don't assume that little tiny triangles are for hunting little tiny animals. Uh, people shot innumerable deer with points that big. Because it's the weight of the arrow and the sharpness of the edge, not the size of the point. When you get it, when the arrow is shot into that deer, that arrow has enough weight and enough speed to travel really far and cut, 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 cut. It's pretty common for an arrow to go all the way through the deer and out the other side and either protrude or fall out on the ground. And I guarantee you, if you have two holes to the outside, that deer will go into shock faster, lose more blood faster, and you don't have to chase it or track it so far. When you shoot a deer, it's dead, but it's got a couple of hundred yards of running left in it. Its heart has a few beats left, and that's it. But if you completely open up the chest cavity like that, it drops right there and you don't lose it. So, okay, well, let me do a little bit. So I'm going to plan a flake off of this. No, I did that already. You saw the obsidian one. So I'm going to take I thought I had one in that box. Never mind. Okay, let me take another flake off of this. Okay, I'm going to set it and I'm going to hit it. Now, percussors, I'm going to hit it with a piece of a moose's antler. No moose around here, but people are nowadays buying, selling, and trading things from all over the place. So I was able to get a chunk of moose antler. I traded a, a lesson I did for a school group and uh, got a moose antler. So I'm going to I'm going to hit this so that I get the angle I want so that it will make a nice big flake right there. I think I have it ready. Now, I'm going to do what's called platform preparation. In other words, the spot I hit, if it isn't at a good angle or it isn't strong enough to take a good whack, it will crunch and I won't get a I won't get a shockwave. Shockwave will get all dispersed in the crunching of the edge. So if it's nice and firm and I can hit it nice and cleanly, I'll get a big flake. So there's my flake and that would be ideal for making an arrowhead, a small spear point, something like that. I'm also keeping an eye on my big rock because I would like to thin this thing out and make a big blade out of it. I don't think I'll have any trouble. This is a great piece of rock and I'm going to uh, 
I'm going to be able to make a really nice big tool out of it and 20 or 30 or 40 small tools out of it. What else would I like to do? Well, I can do just so much with a belt that weighs a pound. You want to kind of match the size of the billet to the size of the flake you want to take off. So I hit a big rock with a big platform and I hit it with a big billet. But now that I've got a smaller piece, now I would go down to kind of a light medium sized billet. And this is also cut from a piece of moose antler. By the time you get to this size, there's white-tailed deer that would give you one like this. The reason why I chose this is because I was able to find a piece of the moose's antler that's, that's straight. If it's too curved, it's a little tricky to use. So I like this straight belt. This is great. Um, if I'm breaking obsidian, I'm going to use a hammerstone. Because for some reason the hammerstone seems to take better, longer, bigger flakes off the obsidian than the billet does. You could make tools completely with a billet, with obsidian. So what will I make? Well, I have one more trick up my sleeve. And that is pressure flaking. And pressure flaking is taking maybe just an antler tine, maybe about the size of my finger, and instead of hitting the edge to break off a flake, I'm going to put the tip up against the edge of the stone and push really hard. And it will cause almost a shock wave, but more slipping between the molecules. And the piece will send its force in the path and the little piece will break off, which I'll show you. Again, I have to pre prepare the platform. All right, why don't I work on this one? Um, So, if it's really thin and I try to press on it, I'll probably crunch it. So, I, one of the things I'll do is I'll take a, a rough stone and just grind the thin, thin, thin edge back until it's a little thicker so that the tip of my flaker will work. Now, this flaker is not a piece of antler. It's copper. So, there's a controversy of people who are doing flint napping nowadays, are you expected to work with primitive materials in order to make stone tools? Well, that depends. It depends on whether you're trying to make replicas of artifacts so that you can understand how it worked in the past. So sometimes people are doing these primitive skills so they can answer, like anthropologists, archaeologists, answering questions about the past. There are a lot of things we can't know unless we try to duplicate it, have the same experience, and then we can draw conclusions. So there are people who are flint nappers because they're trying to learn about history. And there are people who are flint nappers because they think it's a beautiful art and they want to do it. So if you're creating art, use whatever tools you like. But if you are trying to ascertain things about history, then you got to do it the historical way. Otherwise, your conclusions may be flawed. So, I used a copper piece, and that is not necessarily fakey or modern because there were some copper tools used in the Great Lakes because there is natural copper, and people did hammer it into different shapes, and they did make some copper flakers. So we've seen that in the archaeological record. Copper lasts really well in the archaeological record. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold it. I'm going to put the tip of the flaker right on the edge that I prepared and push it until that flake pops off. So and I'll work my way along the edge to make the pieces that I want pop off and change the shape of the edge. So one thing I want is for the whole thing to end up flat 
this is a little bit curved. If I'm making an arrow point and it's curved, it's not going to fly properly. It's not going to mount properly in the arrow in the arrow shaft. So I'm paying attention to that sort of stuff. So I'm going to go all over this thing. producing these little flakes, all of which are sharp as razors, and producing a little bit of dust, which is a bunch of particles as sharp as razors. So one of the things that's not good to do is keep on flint napping indoors. As a matter of fact, in Revolutionary War times when uh, people were making gun flints, they made them out of this same stone, but they forced them to work in enclosed sheds and they died in their 30s and 40s from a disease or a condition called silicosis. Um, very closely related to black lung disease and that miners get. Silicosis is any sort of silicon dioxide dust or powder that you inhale. Remember that these things are sharper than scalpels? If you inhale a bunch of razor sharp dust, you cut up the alveoli in your lungs microscopically a little so if you did it once, no problem. If you did it every day for years, you don't get that many years before so much scar tissue builds up in your lungs that you can't ventilate properly, and you get pneumonia and you die. So, so I'm not going to do a lot while I'm sitting inside the studio here. What? I'm not actually in front of a waterfall? So, what can you make? You can make, well, anything you can conceive of. You can chip it into any shape you want. What did people make? Well, they made tools for working with the materials they had. They made tools that they could cut leather so they could stitch clothing. They made tools that they could use to um, fight with, chop down trees, um, hunt animals with, chop vegetables with, cut string and rope and thread. They made tools for engraving. All of those have slightly different edges and angles and such. So one of the things I end up making a lot of are drills. So this is a drill bit. And this is that, that flint from Georgia. I make the pieces so that they are approximately diamond shaped in cross section, or at least round. And they have the rough edges. So the point is sharp like a chisel, and it scrapes. And then the sides kind of clean out the hole. So I have a drill that I made. This is a hand drill that works with just my hands. So it's got a flint point and I have a piece of slate. One thing that we're conscious about if we're learning about stones is the Mohs hardness scale. And they are, it's on a scale of 1 to 10. 10 being diamond, the hardest known mineral, and 1 being <coughs> things like talc and gypsum, things that are very soft. So we have sort of homespun tests for how hard rocks are. If I can scratch it with my fingernail easily, it's a one. If I can barely get a little scratch in it, it's a two. If I can't scratch it with my fingernail, but I could scratch it with the copper, with a piece of copper, it's, I think that's a two. Um, so it goes up. If you can scratch it with a steel nail, it could be a four. And if you can't scratch it with a steel nail, well, then I don't know what we'll scratch it with, a diamond or something like that. So flint, being, a, being quartz, is a seven and a half on the hardest scale. It's considerably harder than steel. I could take my, my little flint drill tip, and I could borrow your carpenter's hammer and scratch my initials in your hammer. This is harder than the hammer. But you saw me break it. Well, how could it be harder and easy to break? Well, hard things that are easy to break. We have a word for that. They're brittle. So this is brittle. Um, that's the whole principle. That's also why they're fragile. So if you take care of them and you never hit them against anything hard, they last a long time. But you'll eventually sharpen them. So anyway, here's a drill. It is attached with plant fibers and deer leg sinew. And then it's got a little bit of natural hide glue on there so that it won't wiggle. It's really well set in there. You could drill a hole with one that's not quite so tightly set, but I hand these to fourth graders so they can do it, and if I didn't have them really glued in there hard, they would hand them back to me disassembled.
Okay, so I have a piece of slate. It's a three on the hardness scale. I'm going to drill a hole in it. Are we there yet? Almost. Okay, almost there. If I wanted to save myself a little time, I could flip it over, find the exact spot, and start from the other side and make the two holes meet in the middle. But I don't have to do that because you can see some holes that I already drilled and they are double tapered, so I did that. All right. So, drilling holes in rocks with rocks. Why would anybody want to do this? It's our oldest craft, but we don't have to make things out of rocks anymore. So, why is this a thing? Well, it's a thing because it helps us to understand how we got here. How do we get here? Well, we built one technology on top of another. And this is the original one. This is the one that made it possible for human beings to hunt bigger animals than ever before. I mean, it used to be if you wanted to catch an animal, you had to grab it with your hands, overpower it, and somehow get it open so you could eat it. It's not easy to do with the kind of teeth we have. These are not for cutting meat or for killing things. Um, so our diet all of a sudden became much more varied with a lot more protein in it and that seems to be a big thing in our development as a species um, we were able to dig holes and, and get roots better we were able to cut wood and make wooden tools this is the one that unlocks all the other ones this is the hardware store this is the toolkit that allows you to manipulate materials to make sure that you got food and better shelter and uh, security and safety and um, to be able to manipulate materials to make clothing and I mean just think of anything that's classically oh yeah that people did that a long time ago they didn't do it without stone tools a oh, fire making would be the other one to cut wooden pieces to make them the right size to make fire So I think it's worth considering um, this activity because it really puts some things into perspective. How did we get here as a species? And uh, what's our relationship to technology? And um, just because we can do something, should we do something? And it also helps me because there are more and more and more things in the world that I'm expected to participate in and more and more technology that I'm expected to use that I can't build, I can't repair, I don't understand it, and I just said, you just use this. That is deeply unsatisfying to me. I do much better. I have my feet under me when I'm working with something where I know where it came from. I know how it got where it, where it is. I know how to use it. I, I can fix it. I can make it. And if it something goes wrong with it, I can make another one. That puts the power back in my hands. That puts me back into being in charge of my own life. So, will you all need to use stone tools in order to do your daily life? Probably not. But, I think we can all use some practice doing activities where you get power and accomplishment and pride back in your own hands. So that's why I like doing ancient technologies. So that's our show. I'm Jeff Gottlieb. This is Earth Skills.